Welcome to Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston's history. This is Episode 9, The Fairbanks Murder. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. And this week, we're going to share a story of rich kid gone astray, ripped from the headlines in 1801. Jason Fairbanks and his presumed sweetheart, Eliza Fales, were the center of a sensational trial that unfolded in a tale that included an alleged suicide pact, an escape from jail, and a manhunt that stretched all the way to the Canadian border. But before we do, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is January 2nd. And on January 2nd, 1895, the Massachusetts House of Representatives moved its proceedings to a new chamber in the State House Annex. They marked the occasion with a certain amount of ceremony, since they had been in their old chamber since moving to Beacon Hill when the new State House was built in 1798. Richard Gridley was born on January 3rd, 1710. That name may not sound familiar, but it should. Gridley was the chief engineer of the Patriot Army that drove the British out of Boston in 1775 and 76. He designed the defenses at Bunker Hill, where he was also wounded. He designed the series of interlocking fortifications that kept the British bottled up in Boston, then also designed the fort that was thrown up at Dorchester Heights to house Henry Knox's cannons. So, why haven't you heard of Richard Gridley? Well, in part because he was pretty old. By the time of the Siege of Boston, he was in his late 60s, and when the Continental Army left for other theaters, he stayed at home and directed the def defenses of Boston. After all, it was his third war. He'd been part of the assault on the French fortress Louisbourg during King George's War in 1745, and he was an artillery officer during the 1759 Siege of Quebec during the French and Indian War. After his retirement, Henry Knox and other younger officers earned much of the revolutionary glory, but we in Boston definitely owe Richard Gridley a debt of thanks. We'll have a link to a brief profile of this forgotten hero in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com slash 010. Wednesday is January 4th, and that's the date in 1974 when the Golden Grasshopper weather vane was stolen from atop Boston Spaniel Hall. Police at first speculated that thieves had used a helicopter for the heist, but the truth turned out to be more pedestrian. A few days after the theft, a steeplejack was arrested in Plymouth and used the location of the weather vane to arrange a plea bargain. Turns out that he had removed the weather vane, but hid it right there in the Faneuil Hall cupola with the idea to hold it for ransom. By July, the weather vane had been repaired and restored and was back on top of Boston's biggest tourist destination. Hugh O'Brien took the oath of office as Boston's first Irish-American mayor on January 5th, 1885. While Yankees had traditionally dominated Boston politics, their hold on the city was slowly slipping as huge numbers of Irish immigrants made their homes in Boston in the latter half of the 19th century. For more about the nativist reaction to Irish Catholic immigration in Boston, stay tuned for next week's episode. After a vote the previous September, Boston officially annexed the independent city of Roxbury on January 6th, 1868. This was the first of the surrounding towns to vote to join the city of Boston, but it certainly wouldn't be the last. In the coming years, Dorchester, Brighton, Charlestown, and West Roxbury would be annexed, culminating with Hyde Park, our neighborhood, which was finally annexed in 1912. We'll have a link in the show notes to a city archives page showing the date each town was annexed to the city. Saturday is January 7th and that's the anniversary of the first manned balloon flight across the English Channel in 1785. Why do we mention it on a Boston history podcast? Because Boston native Dr. John Jeffries was aboard that balloon. Jeffries was a physician and a loyalist who had fled Boston when the British evacuated in 1776, sitting out the war years in England. When Jean-Pierre Blanchard began demonstrating balloons in England, Jeffries was a frequent collaborator. After the war, he moved back to Boston, and he continued his medical practice, and one of his sons was a co-founder of Mass Ioneer. Finally, Sunday is January 8th. On January 8th, 1776, a small Patriot force raided Charlestown, which had been occupied by the British since the Battle of Bunker Hill. They took the British sentries prisoner 
and burned almost all of the houses that had survived the bombardment in June. An officer who watched was pretty amused by the British response. Bunkers Hill took the alarm. The flashing of the musketry from every quarter of that fort showed the confusion of its defenders. Firing, some in the air, some in the Mystic River. In short, they fired at random. And they thought they were attacked at every quarter, which, you may suppose, gave no small pleasure to the general and a number of us who were spectators of the scene from Cobble Hill. But now, on to our main topic, the murder of Eliza Fales by Jason Fairbanks. I've been looking forward to this one since our trip to the Fairbanks house this past summer. For listeners who might not be familiar with it, the Fairbanks house is a historic house museum in Dedham, Mass, that's open to visitors in the summer months. Home to several generations of the Fairbanks family, the structure, which is incredibly well-preserved, is the oldest standing timber-framed building in North America. A large sign on the chimney says that it was built in 1636, but a recent study using dendrochronology indicates that it was built starting in 1637. Dendrochronology, of course, uses the study of tree rings to date when timbers were cut, and the main supporting beam in the oldest section of the Fairbanks house is from a tree that was cut in the winter of 1637 and 1638. So you can see that the Fairbanks family has roots that go back to the founding days of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And by 1801, they were very prominent, wealthy members of Boston society. It would have been a great coup to marry into the Fairbanks family, which I mention now only to point out later how notable it was that the Fales family opted not to. Several generations later, a cousin, Charles Fairbanks, would be Theodore Roosevelt's vice president and Fairbanks, Alaska, is named for the family. Jason Fairbanks, the center of our story and the sixth generation of the Fairbanks family in Massachusetts, was born to Ebenezer and Prudence Farrington Fairbanks in 1780. History does not agree on the young Fairbanks' disposition. Generally, it's believed that Jason Fairbanks was a spoiled, incompetent young man who was such a poor student that his parents resigned themselves to the fact that he would not be able to pursue a professional career and that it would be best for him to learn a trade. Per a newspaper of the day, his proud spirit, indignant at the imaginary disgrace of using his hands in this way to gain a living, would not stoop so low. Rather, he carried on aping the manners of a gentleman and at the expense of his virtuous parents' labor, who used persuasion to no effect on their obdurate son to dissuade him from a liberal education. During his studies, he was frequently guilty of excess, which at the time were imputed to juvenile indiscretions. But before you judge him too harshly, his older brother Ebenezer casts him in a very different light. First off, Jason was born with some sort of abnormality to his right arm that by most accounts rendered the arm useless. At age 12, Jason was vaccinated against smallpox. Listen to episode two for more on that. And of course, he contracted the disease. He was subsequently treated with mercury, which we now know to be toxic. And we can assume that that would have had some sort of effect on his development. Ebenezer describes Jason as hardworking despite these obstacles. He pushed through constant fevers, headaches, fatigue, and overall weakness. And even though he wasn't the best student, he stuck at it because he was determined to earn a living for himself. After Jason's execution, spoiler alert, Ebenezer published a book entitled The Solemn Declaration of the Late Unfortunate Jason Fairbanks. In contrast, everyone can agree on Eliza Fails. One newspaper gave this description. Luxuriant auburn hair flowed in graceful ringlets around her well-turned shoulders, and neck and bosom might with alabaster vie. Her tapered waist, her glowing cheek, tinged with the crimson blush of virgin modesty, displayed the most happy assemblage of the carnation and the lily that ever graced mortal form. We know that Jason and Eliza had been in a courtship for some time, and we know that he was absolutely smitten with her. But her friends did not approve of him, and her father had gone so far as to ban Jason from their house. As typical of the relationship between an 18-year-old woman and a 20-year-old man, though, the parental disapproval 
really had no sway. On the afternoon of May 18th, they had agreed to meet in a thicket about a half a mile away from the Fales house, a spot that they had rendezvoused in before. Around 3 p.m., Jason arrived at the Fales house covered in blood with multiple wounds to his chest, stomach, and throat, and carrying a knife. He told a family member that Eliza had killed herself in the thicket and that he had attempted to do the same. Hat tip to Shakespeare, who appears to be the original author of this story. It does bear a strong similarity to a certain pair of star-crossed lovers. Eliza's father and uncle ran to the field and found her barely conscious, lying on her stomach with her arms up over her head in what seemed to be a defensive posture with 11 stab wounds. The coroner's report reads, Her throat was cut into the windpipe and nearly to the back part of it. She had a wound made with a small knife by a stab in her back between her shoulder blades beside the backbone and not far below the neck. One stab in her side, six deep wounds in her left arm, some of which severed the tendons, two slight wounds in her right arm, and a deep one in her left thumb, which severed the ball from the bone. Ouch. Let's just acknowledge that it is impossible for her to have stabbed herself between the shoulder blades. Innocent until proven guilty, but these wounds are not self-inflicted. Jason was in pretty rough shape too, but his wounds were all to the front and the right side of his body, expected for somebody without the use of their right arm. He was too injured to leave the Fales house until three days later when he was transported to the Dedham jail. After recovering from tetanus, he was indicted and pled not guilty to murder on August 5th. Justice was, of course, much swifter in 1801. He had a very expensive defense team in Harrison Gray Otis and John Lowell Jr., and his trial was set to start the very next day. Let's just pause for a second to acknowledge that defense team. Harrison Gray Otis, by this time, had served in the Massachusetts legislature, had been appointed a U.S. attorney by George Washington, and he'd served as a U.S. representative from Massachusetts. After this trial, he would again serve as a U.S. attorney under John Adams, he'd return to the state legislature for 15 years, he'd get elected to the U.S. Senate, and then he capped it all off by serving as mayor of Boston. I hear John Lowell Jr. was a pretty good attorney, but he kind of pales in comparison. Otis and Lowell went strong with the suicide pact defense and supplemented with arguments that Fairbanks was too weak and sickly to be able to successfully attack a healthy adult. They also brought in witnesses, friends and relatives of Jason, who shared details of a relationship between the two that went back really to childhood. Conversely, Eliza's parents testified for the prosecution that they had no knowledge of any attachment of Eliza to Jason. However, both sides agreed that the two youths... Is it possible the two youths... Uh, uh, to what? Uh, uh, what was that word? Uh, what word? To what? What? Uh, did you say youths? Yeah, two youths. What is a youth? Oh, excuse me, Your Honor. Two youths. Is it possible the two defendants? The two what? The two youths had in fact decided to meet, that Jason did have a knife, and that Jason was with her when she was wounded. They also agreed that a torn up document was found by Eliza's body, a fake marriage certificate that Jason's niece had created for him at his request. The defense produced testimony that Jason had told a friend that he intended to marry Eliza and that if she refused, he would attempt her chastity. So did she tear up the document, scoffing at his suggestion and drive him into a rage? Or did he, as the defense suggested, present the document, lament that it was the closest they would ever get to matrimonial bliss, and then tear it up himself while lamenting, Our tenderest hopes are scattered to the winds. 
And then, being able to bear the thought of living apart from him no longer, she grabbed the knife and she stabbed herself in the back. We'll never know. There's a lot of testimony on both sides, really too much to get into here. But we'll post a link in the show notes to an academic paper that goes into great detail if you'd like to try to sleuth it out for yourself. Now, the jurors deliberated from 10 p.m. Friday night to 8 a.m. Saturday morning, which, I have to say, is not a good way to come to a well-reasoned, sound decision. But the verdict was guilty. An execution date was set for early September, and Fairbanks was remanded to the Dedham Jail. However, 10 days later, on August 18th at about 3 a.m., Jason was broken out of the jail by his brother Ebenezer and a few other relatives and friends. As you can imagine, they headed for Canada, as one does. A $500 reward was immediately posted, and it quickly doubled to $1,000. Every house in Dedham was searched, but to no avail. After several days of hard riding, Fairbanks and a companion had made it to the shores of Lake Champlain in upstate New York. A boat was hired to transport Fairbanks to St. John's, Canada the next morning, and the two checked into a boarding house to stay the night. The next morning, they were feeling good. Freedom was in sight, and not wanting to greet Freedom on an empty stomach, Fairbanks lingered in the boarding house and ordered breakfast. Unbeknownst to our young fugitive, a trio of men, Captain Henry Tisdale, Seth Wheelock, and Moses P. Holt, had been tracking their journey north. Holt had the fastest horse, so he rode ahead that morning and entered the public house to ask if anyone was traveling to St. John's. Rather than just keeping their heads down, Fairbanks' companion stated that they had hired a boat and they offered passage to Holt. The friend then left Fairbanks alone while he went to make arrangements at the docks, giving Holt the opportunity he needed to step outside, notify a townsman to the situation, and then apprehend Fairbanks. The description of Fairbanks' capture is a bit odd. As best as I can tell, Holt literally came up behind him, grabbed him, and shouted for a rope. But then no one in the inn did anything to help him, so he was really left standing there, holding Fairbanks in a full Nelson until Tisdale and Wheelock arrived about 10 minutes later. It may not have actually been a full Nelson, but you get the picture. The trio returns Fairbanks to Massachusetts, and this time he will be housed in the Boston jail, which is deemed more secure. On the morning of September 10th, he was transported by coach back to Dedham for his execution. He was accompanied by two companies of cavalry, a detachment of volunteer infantry, and at the border of Boston and Roxbury was transferred between the Suffolk and Norfolk County sheriffs. About 10,000 people had gathered on Dedham Common to watch the execution. It was a once in a lifetime spectacle promoted by all the local newspapers. One of the broadsides for sale that day contained the following poem. Thou monster in the human shape, whose heart is like the hardest steel. Did you expect the law to scape and not its keen lash feel? For mercy to the Lord then cry, for now is come the awful day. Poor soul, you are sentenced now to die. Such crimes demand your life as pay. And you, his friends and kindred too, with you we hearty sympathize. Whose hearts with grief are pierced through to see the manner Jason dies. Don't murmur at the hand of God in all your trial, though severe. Tis he himself permits the rod. O oh, serve him then with heart sincere. Yet behold the shocking sight, this day exposed to view, and may his end a warning prove to every one of you. Fairbanks was buried in Dedham's first parish cemetery, and his and Eliza's stones are still intact today and legible. Turning to the Fairbanks family at large, this trial was really their absolute demise. Remember, they'd been one of the most wealthy and prominent families in Dedham, but their fortune was almost completely consumed by Jason's defense. Harrison Gray Otis, don't come cheap. 
Additionally, the public scandal meant that marriage was no longer really an option for the young Fairbanks girls, who no longer had rich dowries and a good name. This branch of the family really fell into poverty, and that's actually what allowed the house to endure in its original state. Ebenezer's unmarried daughters lived in the house until 1879. They simply could not afford to tear it down and build a new one, or to make upgrades like electricity and indoor plumbing. Additions were built onto the original 1637 structure in the late 1600s and again in the late 1700s, but the central house structure remained basically unchanged from the earliest days of Massachusetts Bay Colony. While the neighbors in Dedham were adding 19th century luxuries like indoor plumbing, gas lamps, and eventually electricity, the Fairbanks women were living basically a 17th century lifestyle with candlelight and outdoor privy. The last resident, a niece named Rebecca, finally moved out in 1904, allowing the house to become a museum, one that we highly recommend. All right then, where can people find out more about the Fairbanks murder? We'll post pictures from our visit to the Fairbanks House Museum in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com slash zero one zero. We'll also have links to a newspaper broadside depicting the hanging of Jason Fairbanks and Melancholy Catastrophe, a two-part detailed research paper by Dale Freeman that was the main source for today's episode. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash hubhistory, and our Twitter handle is at hubhistory. You can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com, or go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're there, be sure to click on Subscribe to see all the ways to subscribe to the show. If we're not on your favorite podcast app, drop us a line and let us know. That's all for now. We'll be back next time with a show about the Ursuline Convent Riots of 1834 and the anti-immigrant sentiment to let the perpetrators walk free.